me putting my glass in. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to this discussion, um, Black Women in Hospitality, Lifting the Lid. It's um, an important conversation and I'm glad that we're having it. Um, I think it's, um, it's about time, perhaps a bit long overdue. Um, and thank you to, um, to the three of you for taking part in this. And thank you to Ladies of Restaurants and Natalia for giving us this platform and their unlimited Zoom account. Um, and for everyone tuning in, thank you for joining us and please send us your questions. Um, we will be monitoring them through the chat and um, yeah, questions and comments and everything. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Melissa Thompson. I run the Food and Rescue Project at Foulmouth and I write a bit about food and everything else kind of related to it. And joining us, we have Zoe Ajonio of Ghana Kitchen. Um, Zoe started off with, um, with street food, um, sort of in its purest form, and then um, supper clubs and pop-ups and then her own restaurant um, in Brixton. And, um, and she's also a published author with her book, Zoe's Ghana Kitchen. And we've also got um, Kim Sower, who uh, founded Coffee and Fandisha, uh, which is a coffee shop in Liverpool. Um, very highly regarded. I've been checking out the, the, the reviews. Um, <laughs> and, um, and we've also got Laudi, Lord, Lordi Gibber-Smith, beg your pardon, um, who's joining us from Hong Kong and you just finished a busy service at Mise Inside Rogani. And you're also the Young British Foodie uh, Front of House um, 2018 winner. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm excited. Um, I guess for context, uh, we're here on the back of a, a sort of unprecedented, certainly in, in I think most of our lifetimes period, following the death, the murder of George Floyd and everything that's happened since. Um, and it's really brought discussions of race to the fore. And I think what seems really unprecedented about this time is that there is a focus on the experience of black people um, specifically. And where we've had discussions like this in the past, I think now it's also looking at other arenas, uh, apart from the usual kind of law and enforcement, and there, um, we're actually looking at other areas such as hospitality, which is why we're here. Um, and um, I think I'd like to, to start. When I went into food, I, I had this idea that it was a real, a really honest industry. Um, you make food, it either tastes good or it doesn't, and, um, and you either do well or you don't. And I'm starting to think that that maybe isn't the case. I mean, do you think that was, a, a, is that naive? Is it, is it merit meritocratic? Or, or other, other issues at play? Zoe, can, can I start with you? You can, yeah. No pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm surprised to hear you say you're starting to think that's not the case, because that's always been the case in my experience. Um, merit, meritocracy only exists in a certain amount of space in this industry, and even then the meritocracy isn't really meritocracy because it's about the network of people who you have access to in order to, to, to climb the ladder, so to speak. So um, I don't think the making of food, the cooking of food, the representation of uh, the people who do that work um, or provide the service of that work, I don't think there's any aspect of that where there's ever been a level playing field. And that's evidenced by the lack of black faces in, winning awards on telly, in the media, writing, editing, publishing, um, anything to do with food. And that's, that's the landscape we have right now. It always, it always comes as a, a surprise when that happens. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, don't, I don't know why, but if, if I ever see a person of colour win anything, like quite, quite like either prestigious or, or in the media, it's, it's always like, uh, like subconsciously it's like oh it's, it's quite surprising that but I, it shouldn't be because like we we are there and there are obviously a lot of us who who are um you know excellent at what we do but we just sometimes i feel like we have to work three times harder to get the recognition that we deserve that we might get if if we went if we went uh, a person of color um 
no, there's, it's, it's definitely, there's no, not really much uh, level playing field when it comes to stuff like that. Um, and, you know, th there's lots of reasons for that, actually. It isn't just, like, it, racism isn't the only re reason why, why that is true, because I think in a lot of black cultures, um, you know, even as a starting point, it's just not considered a career full stop, really. Like being in food, being in catering hasn't traditionally, historically been a desirable career. If you are the child of black parents, then those black parents will want you normally to study a hard degree. By that, I mean, not difficult. I mean, like mm. a poor degree, like accounting, like law, like uh, medicine, because they know that their, you know, their experience is informed by racism. And so therefore they know that in order for their children to succeed, they have to be in the, the best, they have to be the best equipped. And they think, I think that the being equipped means having a law degree, having a, you know, a hard science or a hard engineering or a hard degree that nobody can take away from you. Nobody can deny your qualification once you've got it. And then there's a clear, sort of career ladder that you will follow and you will be okay, right? That's, that, I think that's the thinking generally in domestically in black spaces or has been. And so the, I, the concept of even reaching for that career that, that probably doesn't occur to a lot of people. And even if they wanted to, there is no representation of them for them to reach out to as inspiration. If it, you know, you can't be what you don't see essentially. So, you know, that is a huge gap. And I, you know, I, I, I for, I for, I, the forward to that was me saying it's not necessarily racism, but actually it is. It's still systemic racism that's feeding that mentality that food isn't a career where you will ever find success. Um, but it, it's born out, it's born out mm. to be true in the practice of, you know, the, the endless lists I see that never have a black name on them and, or a black face associated or the endless awards where black people aren't represented. Um, you know, it, there's just endless occasions where the only people you see um, in the me, you know, and then when you do see a black face, like um, Laudi says, it's it's either surprise or more often than not, my initial reaction is, oh well, that's tokenism, right? So they put a black person in there to make it look like they're being diverse. Um, and Which is interesting, isn't it? Because if you look at, um, I, I think Ruby Ruby Tando was talking about Great British Bake Off and and how that's acted as a springboard for so many black and um, people of colour in food, and and you think think about the people who come from there. So we've got Ruby herself, you've got Nadia, um, Liam, uh, Tamal, Selassie, uh, Benjamina, and I can't imagine a food landscape now without those names. And yet, I think if we're honest, they were probably only ever on that show because of tokenism, because you know the production company has got, right, have we got enough black people, have we got enough women? Um, yeah. And so there's something that's quite uncomfortable. I don't, what do you, do, do, like, how does it make you feel when you, when you know that it's tokenistic, but at the same time, sometimes, um, like, where do you join the, the line between tokenistic and, and representation? How do you get that balance? How do you get the balance? Um, well, there shouldn't, there's just, tokenism just shouldn't be there in the first place. It's not really about balancing anything. It's about the appropriate amount of inclusion based on skills and qualifications. The end, really. It's not about balancing tokenism. It's about removing tokenism. And if you are truly being a diverse, or, or you want to represent diversity, and if you want to speak to the greatest number of people and have an inclusive conversation, then you have to include the voices that rep will be representative of that landscape. And so tokenism just shouldn't exist. It's like, we wouldn't call it tokenism. If, 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 if on a list of 20 people, there were at least always four, four black faces, and I don't mean just people of colour, I mean black faces, amongst the people of colour. Like, there, there shouldn't be a limit, you know, mm -hmm. but there should be a, a more even, broad representation of what the industry looks like. And, and all too often the industry focuses on well London predominantly for a start and then beyond that you know, in London then it's very much focused around fine dining it's focused around the finer end of you know whatever people can conceive that to be of dining um, and very often our faces aren't going to be in those spaces because 
as I say, we, we probably haven't gone to culinary, you know, in some, like in my own case, for example, you don't go to, you didn't go to culinary school, you didn't come up through the restaurant scene, so you don't have that network of chefs who are going to like, uh, you know, build you up and build your career and so on. So you're coming all the way from the outside, but, and then for a lot of black people, you know, in, whenever I've been in kitchen spaces, more often than not, the, the black people are in you know, the KPs and they're, at the sort of lower end of the thing. And, and the very, very, very few instances where the, you know, I've seen a black person be the sous chef or even the head chef. Um, I'd yeah. like to explore that. I'd like to explore that point. And they've never um, anywhere in part of that success story of that yeah. restaurant. Yeah. No, I, I want to come back to sort of the, the um, representation within, within establishments. Um, but talking about this um, sort of representation and also I, I think, I think there's a sort of realization, emerging realization about how it's quite a, um, it's, it's a very cliquey industry and, mm -hmm. um, and people, things I've been hearing is that people don't necessarily get as much coverage or black owned businesses don't get as much help because it's hard to break into that clique. Um, Kim, I mean, your, your um, Coffee and Pandisha is based in Liverpool. How have you found it? Well, to be honest, Melissa, like, I did go and, you know, I went into this business purely from, you know, with passion. I was passionate about, about what I was doing and I, yeah, I was completely naive and it's only up until recently I wonder, I've understood the word, the, the meaning of the word tokenism. Like, I had no idea what it even meant. Um, you know, Liverpool is a, it's a predominantly white city and it doesn't scream diversity in any way. Um, but you know, for years now, I have, I have, um, I have understood. Um, I, I do believe that you know Liverpool is a very clicky. It's a very clicky city, and I have questioned certain times when we haven't had certain cover. You know, the coverage that other businesses have had that have been that are owned by um, white business owners. I have questioned that, but I've always put it down to, oh, we're not part of the click whatever that may be. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, it has, it's confused me because I've just settled with that for, for years now. And it's only up until now where I've questioned it and I've addressed it and I've realized, is it just because we're not part of the clique or is it more so because um, the people with, you know, the, the people with the power, social media platforms with the power, is it because they're telling, they want to tell a certain story you know, they want to, they have a certain narrative. Um, and, you know, if, uh, you know, two <laughs> black women um, who own a business come along, are we spoiling, you know, their narrative? And I have thought about that in recent, but I'm still in shock by all of this because I literally, as I said, I've just been, you know, we've just been trying to just, you know, make our business a success, a success story. And it's up until now, it's, I mean, now I'm like, wow, there's so much more, there's more to it. So it's, it is, it's, it's difficult for me. Uh, but I do believe, you know, if for Liverpool, for sure, like there is definitely a, a very defined click and I can't work out what that is, but like, some, like I can honestly say that, um, you know, the people who are um, marketing and promoting and pushing a hospitality businesses they don't look like us they don't look like black women you know uh, so yeah that's because it, there's it's, a lot it's of a, talk isn't there about this industry and especially especially now um in the time of of covid19 and it being a community um but i think one thing that's really coming out is that it's um maybe a community but that not all people are are welcome um, certainly, I'm, I'm not saying they're sort of active, actively against people, but that it's, it, it, it is a bit of an exclusive club. Um, and a, a club where a lot of the same names get, get spoken about and um, to, the, um, to the exclusion of, of others. Um, yeah, I mean, I, mean I feel like this is all, I mean, this is just obvious from, like, we can all see this. Like, this isn't, I don't feel like this is new. No. Mm -hmm. It's a new thing. Like we see this all the time because we don't see ourselves or anybody who looks like ourselves winning awards in the media. Blah, blah, blah. We don't see enough black PR food business, like black women in food PR. Therefore, we don't see enough uh, black businesses well represented. But even if we did have more black PR agencies, 
would they be able to get the businesses they want to push into this, the same media channels mm. not because the media is owned by a certain group who you know a handful of puppeteers let's say who have their own agenda and have their own interests and they want to you know push their best friend's son or cousin or whoever it is they've got a new restaurant we're going to this one i'm mm. sorry i don't give a shit about that amazing talent from liverpool doing x y or z so like, this mm. is what i care about and this is what i want my my readership to care about so you know I, I said this again recently about the whole giles corran backlash thing it's like it's very easy to make him a scapegoat but actually you know the problem is with the times and the times leadership and you know why haven't we seen the industry in uproar demanding apologies demanding a resignation demanding that we boycott anyone who still reads the times i don't know anybody who reads it but do you know what i mean it's like why doesn't if the industry cared about racism then it would yeah it would be campaigning to end that kind of nonsense it would be campaigning itself it shouldn't take four of us on a zoom telling them things that are completely obvious you know it's um i feel like we're why, why do you think the industry um why do you think the industry does stay stay so silent um i mean i've been trying to get get people to acknowledge the problem with that with you know well, it doesn't with but, Giles Corrin in the newspaper. Our, 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 we as humans, our brains are are made in order to make our lives as easy as possible, right? That's why we have muscle memory. That's why we know how to ride a bike, even though we haven't done it for ten or fifteen years. Is because your brain just puts away information. It doesn't want you to think too hard about stuff. It just it's, it's got a lot going on, so it always finds the easiest route. And for a lot of people, the easiest route is not to examine the fact that whether they're aware of it or not, that there mm. are racism and also that there is racism systemically in their institutions and in their dominantly white spaces. And it is a huge challenge to them to confront that because it's going to make them feel uncomfortable. And the end result is only going to be to, to push them off of, off of their own table, so to speak. So why would they do that work unless there is a huge amount of pressure to do so? Because in giving us space it takes it away from themselves obviously and in giving us space it takes control of all of the narratives around food out of their hands solely because we each bring a completely different perspective and narrative around our food concepts and food businesses mm. perhaps ones in many cases that they don't relate to or can't understand again making them scared of you know so it's this consistent we are consistently other okay and they are consistently wanting to keep the status quo that's the relationship we have and, and, and i guess that, that it, going on from that it, it's I, I guess um like you know sort of food cooked by black people um food from african countries and food from sort of the caribbean islands is generally perceived to be quite um uh it's not, it, like cheap food which is which is something I've spoken to a, a lot with people, and and I mean, uh, what about the lack of? Um, I mean, it's, not that it's cheap actually. I I mean, you're right on that. Can I just speak to that for a second? It, it's more that the the problem when it comes, and also we should be we shouldn't be concerned only with the fact that you know black chefs cook food from their from their origin countries. Yes, but black chefs also are executive chefs at Jamie Oliver's restaurants, and they cook Italian food, they cook French food, they cook. You know, that's the other problem is pigeonholing um, black chefs into, oh, you're a black chef, so I'm only going to call you and I have something to say about Jollof or whatever the boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you know what I mean? So it, it's, um, there's, there's layers and layers and layers and layers. It's a big fat layer cake. Um, and I think it would take us 100 years to unravel it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I wanted to go back to as well talking about um, the role of black people within the hospitality industry. You were saying about how um, you frequently see, um, say, black people as the KPs. And it, um, I remember someone recently uh, said to me about people coming into the restaurant and when they were black, they would get um, sort of interviewed for the KP role, whereas um, white people would come in and they'd be interviewed for, for the commies and, 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 you know, sort of commie chef. Um, and, and there was sort of a marked difference in, in what people being sort of the direction people are being pushed in um lordy i mean you're working at um at a michelin starred restaurant in hong kong you're the head waiter um what's your experience been um, um well my of, experience of, of i mean personally obviously i've always gone i've always gone for um 
different roles and and I don't I've never been no one's ever been able to pigeonhole me um so so and and I'm quite outspoken and with my family background um it was natural for me to go into hospitality uh, working front of house because I'm very good with people um and and I love my job however I always noticed that whenever people of color do as you said when they apply for jobs they always go for like they always end up getting kp jobs and i don't know whether it's a language barrier um but i i also feel like they they don't think that they would be good enough to be on the floor um which is sad um but a lot of the times they get kp jobs but as i was saying uh, as i said the other day get a lot of fr french people you know that don't speak a word of english that come and they work front of house and i don't know whether that's because in their culture you know hospitality is a job um just like in a lot of europe hospitality is a job whereas mm -hmm. in a lot of countries as you said before zoe um a lot of black families it's, it's like frowned upon unless you become a lawyer or a doctor or you know and i think that's because a lot of immigrant families always have always seen the harsh reality of if you don't get a job in one of those sectors, then you you're not seen as being successful. Um, so, which is why they tend to stay away from from hospitality. You get a lot of people in England that end up in hospitality because oh they failed at school or you know they weren't interested in studying or they they failed at uni and so it's like a last resort it's a last ditch attempt to be able to earn some money but without actually loving the 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 job or, or the or the you know loving hospitality itself um but fortunately in the last few years i've seen a rise in in um women representing front of house which is nice uh, i mean um the there's in gold service scholarship last year there was a the the winner was a, was a, a you know a, a girl of color that works at glen eagles so it's it is becoming a lot better for us but there's there's still a long way to go i mean sometimes guest experiences can be not daunting but insulting and i don't i don't think that they know that they're being insulting um as i said uh, so um a few years back uh, like uh, was it 2012 uh, i think it was nicola adams who just won the boxing and uh, and i went in bearing in mind i don't look any different now to 2012 just slightly more more rotund and a guest said to me oh you look like that boxer nicola adams and i was like so, sorry what like i didn't have cornrows i just had my hair tied up and they just linked me to another black girl just because she won the boxing another time i've had guests you know they asked me oh where are you from and now i don't have an african accent I mean, I was born in the Gambia, but I've, I've lived in England majority of my life. And so when you get asked, where are you from? And, and I say, you know, Clitheroe, which is a little town, they're like, oh no, but where are you from from? And it's like, where do you think I'm from? Like, I just told you, you know, but it's, it doesn't fit with their idea of where I'd be from. Or I think the worst one there was um, when uh, guests asked me if um, my parents were white and I was like, um yeah I suppose and they're like oh I can tell you've got a lovely temperament and I was just like oh my god <laughs> yeah wow. and I was just like oh wow. enjoy your meal <laughs> how, how do you keep your cool or do you, in, in in a situation like that you oh. just you just I mean it sort of similar to to why we don't dispute you know racism in in newspapers it's because you're taught, taught from a young age to sort of put up with it. And if someone says something like that, especially when you're working, you can't lose your call. Well, you can't afford to, and it, you know, it might taint your image. And, and you might, you know, it might be seen as like maybe aggressive or something. If, if you do say, do you realize what you just said, you know? So you just have to take it on the chin and get on with it and sort of like ignore it or, yeah or talk to your friends about it and laugh, <laughs> to be honest. Wow. Yeah. I mean, talking about, obviously you working in a, in a Michelin-starred restaurant, 
talking about the sort of the how Eurocentric um, fine dining is um, certainly in in Britain and um, and elsewhere. Um, I mean, do, do you like? Do you, do you think there could, there would ever be an appetite for, um, pardon the pun, but for um, fine dining concepts that are of specific, um, say, from specific African countries? Um, I mean, there's Ikoyi, but uh, Ikoyi is not classed as a West African um, as a West African restaurant. Uh, and again, that ties into the perception of of um, of, of black food. Um, mm. uh, Zoe. Uh, well, first of all, we already have Stork in Mayfair, which is also fine dining. And we also have a Coco opening in October, which was due to open in April. Yes. And I have Sankofa, which I've been running for a year as a supper club in, here, uh, in New York, mostly, actually. And it's been very well received. And all of these spaces, when they're doing it well, are very well received. So... Oh, we're, we're, we've lost you. Come back. Sorry, we lost you a bit there, Zoe. Oh. The, the, the question is, is there an appetite? Of course, yes, there is. Where, whether or not the industry realises an appetite and will champion any of those restaurants or concepts is a completely separate issue. The likelihood is they won't, because they've already decided that Ikoyi is the benchmark for West African fine dining, even though Ikoyi isn't a West African restaurant. It's not. And, 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 you know, they're happy with that. And they're all patting themselves on the back. Look what we found. Didn't you do well? Well, you didn't do very well, actually, guys. <laughs> Try harder. That's it. Yes, they're not looking. This, and this is the point that goes back to nepotism and it goes back to cliques and networks and why so many, so much of the, the you know, the, so many white men in particular, actually, um, are profiled consistently in the media and it is like that whole it's the same as how politics works you know if you're going to be in cabinet one day then you've probably gone to Eton you're probably part of the Bullingdon Club all of those people are from a certain specific specificity of a race class and probably postcode to be honest and in the upper echelons of the food industry that's exactly the same situation so it's just this self-perpetuating problem which is why I keep saying nothing is going to change systemically unless the top shelf changes so unless there's you get black people on the boards of publishing houses and you know media companies and um, in you know who are the editors who are the control who have the controlling voice who who have and the reason I'm saying that is because black people inherently have a, a wider scope of a vision, a wilder field of vision. We have to, because we're always, and also historically having to be creative and flexible in, in, in our adapting to white society constantly. So inherently we just have a, a much broader scope of vision and um, are more curious, right? Because we have to be. Yeah. Whereas in, we, 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 people in the white castle, let's call it, they don't have to look out, right? They've got everything inside. They've got, it's all just there in front of them. They don't, there's no need to think, there's no need to go beyond what they know. They're just, you know, and, that, and that's the happy box they're, 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 they're okay with. And then the rest of us on the outside are like, um, can you tilt the box please so we can see what's inside? <laughs> that's my metaphor yeah. for the day. Yeah. <laughs> I no, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good metaphor. Um, I was um, uh, so I read a piece the other day um, that was it on um, in Eta and uh, by Jonathan Nunn, and there was um, a, a bit in it that really um, struck with me. Um, so it was um, uh, Frankie, bear with me, Frankie Reddin of A and F um, uh, Consulting, a PR agency. So she um, represented um, our Island Social Club pro bono and then got the coverage in the Evening Standard and on television. And um, I mean, do you want to see more of that? Do, do you think that PR companies with all their contacts who, who have not helped to draw um, black people working in food into that club and try, trying to get representation, do you think there needs to be some, like an active push to, to, to try to help people? Because it's a, it's a club that I certainly didn't know how to navigate when I went into food. Because like you said, it was, I don't have that background. And so it's all alien. I don't know who I need to speak to. How, how can this be addressed? Are you asking if we need more pro bono work 
Well, this was this was a, this was a call that was made in this in this piece that maybe more people could more PR companies could could do that and to and to actually and to actively support um, to to help inclusion and diversity. Um, I, I mean, like, well, yeah, oh, you know, yes. I mean, the short answer to that is yeah, that would help, right? But actually, the bigger work is actually to to, to put black people on the same footing in terms of their wealth and their earning potential as white people, and then it wouldn't have to be pro bono. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah, Frankie does, you know, I know Frankie, we're working together on a project separately, but you know, that's a beautiful thing she does, but she does that because she's black and she does that because she knows that the industry is difficult for black faces and black voices to cut through. And she has um, a certain amount of access you know, and a certain amount of privilege actually, as do I, as a light-skinned black person, we, we get privilege out of that. So sh she uses that privilege and platform to help people. Um, and that, but that's coming from a point of view that isn't about capitalism, you know? Um, and that's why we align very well working together and as a friendship, because we, we both think similarly. It's not about us, it's not about making money all the time. It's about, well, what is the future landscape of food gonna look like? How do we help? change that you know but yes absolutely there's plenty of pr companies that earn i mean i used to work in pr right i know how much i'm being overcharged every time i've used a pr company and you know it's very difficult to get a, a good rate of return on that as well because you know essentially what a pr company is going to do is send out a press release call a couple of people maybe blah, 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 and send you some clippings and it's like well you know, actually, if every small business knew that, they could probably do that themselves, right? But it is harder to just pick up the phone. You, you know, your call might not get to it, but whatever, it's relevant. The point is, uh, what we actually need is more black PR companies, because what's the incentive? But, well, what we don't want to do is create a white saviour complex more than already exists. Right? You know, we don't want handouts from the industry. What we want is fair treatment. We want fair access. We want equal pay. You know, we just want equality. We don't need loads of handouts. And, um, but you know, if anyone was right minded, then probably that's something that we would be considering, or they would be considering tithing some of the profits from their company to organizations that might help um, disadvantaged communities, you know, get into culinary college, get into culinary training, pay people for star jays, things like that, rather than assuming everybody can afford to work for six months, 80 hours a week, free, because they can't. And what what's that? Yeah, but like uh, I can't. Yeah. yeah. There's been a couple of examples um, recently, um, which um, have been spoken about quite quite uh, quite widely. First of all, you had the Evening Standards um, video celebrating the diversity of London's food scene. That out of seventy people, only included one um, one black person. And then there's also a cookbook, um, and it's staying in cookbook. And um, and when I, I I I looked at that, and I actually. I, I purposely looked to see who was included because I knew that it would just some. I just knew it wasn't going to be rep, um, representative, and then and and the feedback I've had from the, both of the organisers of those different things is that I'm really sorry. Um, it was done in a rush, and we wanted to raise money for charity, so we basically looked at our phone book and we called our mates, um, which is also making me realise that it's sort of looking at the wider issue that I don't think that there doesn't seem to be like a, a lot of white people don't seem to have very many, have very many black friends. Clearly. And, um, <laughs> and I find that, I find that like, I, I, again, it's not something like that's new to me because I see images of, of uh, you know, uh, sort of like the groups of people and, and they're exclusively white. I see PR companies and I, you know, PR companies love showing us images of their staff. And they're all exclusively, they're exclusively white. And, 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 and Kim, you've touched on this just before. So but the people that um, run the big social media accounts, or, you know, I, I guess the kind of the sort of um, hyper-local journalism um, in, in Liverpool, are, 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 do you know any black person running? Them? No. 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 I, um, no, not, not at all. Like... I don't know any any black pe I I almost feel um did you say black people in in which um did you say marketing was that Melissa what's well, marketing I... in PR but also the hyper local journalism so kind of especially sort of food dedicated online pub publications and things like that 
Not really. I mean, if, you know, if I'm honest, we haven't, like, we haven't engaged. We haven't done a lot of marketing for, for our business. Um, we, the sort of marketing that we use is, um, you know, we, we use social media. We have our own social media platform and then we use Liverpool based social media platforms who have got, you know, they, they are quite powerful and they do um, capture a wide audience. But I don't know any any black, like black um, people in journalism, like at, at all. Um, okay. To be honest, <laughs> I almost feel like I don't know a lot of black people in the hospitality industry period, like in Liverpool, like I think maybe two, two, like three before, um, up until last week, I think I knew of two cafes slash restaurants owned by black people. That's it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So, um, as I said, like, this is me and my business partner. I've just been so focused on just making the success out of our own, you know, sort of our own business. And we haven't focused on anything else really. And it's only coming to light now how shocking it is. Like, there are no other, there are not many other black people in hospitality in Liverpool um, I'm not even sure who I would turn to in terms of black in, you know when it comes to black journalists anyone in, in PR uh, who I would feel comfortable you know sharing my story with who I um, would feel confident in um, yeah just just putting it out there to, to an audience because I, I almost feel as though what what we do is not what wants to be put out there, if that makes sense. It just, I don't so know. So you're almost worried I, that your story would get twisted to fit into the narrative they want to present? I, I think so. I, I think so. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I think a little bit, yeah. Because they have this set narrative. They have this set narrative. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we, you know, I'm black, my business partner, Keely, she's black. And we don't, you know, we we haven't got a specific, you know, we're a coffee shop, so that's first and foremost. Um, we it's spe speciality coffee, and then after that, we do, um, you know, we offer lunch, but that's it, it's not from a, it's not a specific cuisine, it's not African food, it's not Caribbean food, you know. So we it's almost like we cater for all, but I don't know whether people you know on the outside assume that we're gonna you know that we sell you know African cuisine or Caribbean cuisine before they come to us so I don't know like as I said it's only up until it's only recent where I've really tried to analyze and work out what is actually going on. Actually that reminds me of when uh, when my family and I first moved to well when we moved to England and yeah. uh, they opened um, a restaurant uh, and then it was in Le Routier. I don't know if anyone remembers that. <laughs> uh, Le Routier. And I remember my parents got annoyed because um, our, the, the Le Routier, it's like, it's like, it was like, um, kind of like Michelin, like it was like one of those sort of like you, you get put into the book and people can read about you and there was like a blue ribbon and stuff like that. And I remember they described my parents' restaurant as, um, like African cuisine and my parents were like it's not it's it's modern <laughs> British food and like we told them but all they had in their mind was oh we we've, we've moved from from West Africa and they were like oh yeah African cuisine and my mom was like no it's not like absolutely not and they just assumed like they just heard what they wanted and then put that in and it's just like yeah I remember my my parents getting really annoyed about that and obviously they, they contacted them and told them they was wrong um, but it, your story just reminded me of, of that. But that bearing in mind, that was like mm. back in like 2000, 2005, 2006. Um, yeah. But yeah. Well, I, I, it goes back to the whole problem though. It's like, it, in terms of how they want to narrativize, narrativize us, it's like, if you're black, then there has to be some other hook, right? It must always, be. Yeah, people, yeah always. You can't, you can't just be like, you can have a fucking, uh, vegan, the best vegan brownie cafe in the world, and be a black woman, and they would have to and that's serve it. Yeah. black 
into it somehow. Ooh, mm. vegan brownies with a Caribbean twist. By yeah. <laughs> or or yeah, they want a story, they want a backstory about how you kind of came from a, a yeah. background or, or you avoided gang life by baking yeah. or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Basically, they want to keep, and this is the problem with this, they want to keep any stereotypes alive and they act, you know, they actively pursue that line of story, actually. They pursue that kind of narrative. They want you to have struggled, but you can't just be a fucking successful black woman. There no. has to be appalling bullshit behind you and it's just not the case. And it, and it yeah. you know, I've spawned quite a lot. So. <laughs> I do sometimes think like with um with my business is it are we not publicized are we not promoted in the way i feel that we deserve because we are offering similar things to um what you know what's trending are we seen as i don't know are we seen as a threat almost and um, because we are black women and i don't know this might be wrong in me thinking this but they don't want us to succeed in the same way you know and that's it's just like i'm just doing me like i'm trying to make my business a success and that is it so why are it you makes not you promoting? paranoid though doesn't it, it like, does. you yeah. become it does. paranoid because even with like getting promotions and stuff like that sometimes you i feel like i have to work three times harder than my peers to get any sort of recognition but then you start thinking you're like maybe is it the way i'm working or or is it that genuinely subconsciously yeah. that i have to work harder and jump through heaps of fire you know and then someone else does you know probably less work and they get a pat on the back um yeah. and then they're like oh you're, you're doing what you're meant to so you you know you just just tell you to, to keep going um, you know, and um, yeah, sometimes it, it, it makes you paranoid because you're thinking, you're like, is it me or is it, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, you're being racist, but sometimes you're yeah. like, I think, I think there's something going on. Yeah. Well, it was an impossible situation, isn't it? Because it's so, it's so subtle. Um, I mean, it manifests in not so subtle ways, but then there's no recourse for, for, for us to be able to address it because you can't say, are you asking me this because I'm, I'm black? Because you know that it will come out with an outright denial. No one's ever going to admit that. And I think it's, um, and, and you carry that, I think, uh, around you and you're kind of constantly trying to second guess. Um, but in and, England, and can I just, uh, oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to really briefly, we have, we've had a comment um, and um, we've had a few comments and it's someone who um, is from a South Asian background who has turned to doing food, um, sort of food deliveries. And she said that when she um, sort of, she changes the cuisine and when she does a curry night, it's a sellout. Whenever she does anything else, whether it's pasta or something, it, like there's a marked difference, um, which I thought was interesting to, to include here, because um, what we've mm. been speaking about, about, about the idea of what, what black people are almost allowed to cook. Mm. Yeah. Um, and we've got another question here, and, and this question I think is, is um, so it's, uh, it's a woman who says, um, to get things done, there's a hierarchy in restaurants, to get things done, um, the, person, the person in the position of power needs to be assertive and make decisions confidently. This kind of behaviour among chefs is called leadership, however, if that chef, chef happens to be black, the angry, feisty, sassy trope comes into play, whether knowingly or unknowingly. <laughs> Um, and it can knock your confidence. And instead of thinking about the decisions that need to be made first, you can find yourself thinking about the best way to say it, the, 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 how, how it needs to, the best way to say it, which can make you fumble. Um, and so this person is, has said, is there a suitable way to react being called sassy or aggressive by people trying to undermine your authority when work needs to get done? And I mean, I mean beyond saying, tell them to do, to do one, um, I mean, what, what, what does anyone have to, to say to that? Just from, from my experience, um just just own it like if they call you sassy fiery you know just just go with it because all the time like i i always get called you know sassy or fiery and that's because i don't if i see something wrong i'll say something you know because it's it's part of my job to if it's you know to to point out things that are wrong um to if someone's working you know and and you do get told oh, you're quite sassy or oh you're quite fiery. is that really you being sassy or fiery or surely that's just you no, doing your job assertive, well. but you're just being assertive but if you know if a white man does it oh you know he's 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 being a good boss a good manager 
if a white woman does it, you know, they're, they're, they're seen as being, you know, oh, well done, you, you know, good for you, you're being assertive. If a black woman does it, or, you know, it's like, oh, you're quite aggressive, you're quite confrontational, um, which, you know, you just, I, I just, I just keep on going and then just ignore, I ignore those points because it, you get so used to it, which, I mean, you shouldn't do, but you get used to it. And so I just, I just say, yeah, it's part of my character, you know, but I asked you to do this, so, so do it, you know. It's, um, it, and I, when I was a lot younger, there were times where I'd be like, oh, you know, I'll try and word this, this softly, you know, and, and there were times where someone would be like, oh, you know, you, you came across quite harsh, and can you, can you say it in a, in a slightly softer way, you know, and I was just like, what? <laughs> I've literally just listened to someone else speak worse mm. than me and not get berated at all, you know, and, 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 and I do call, I call them out. So, on it. Okay. I feel, um, I feel I think, like, uh, sorry, I think the reception's going a bit funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what, what do you say? What, what do you say to Lordy? I felt like, yeah, I, I, I can see that you're sort of wanting to yeah i mean i disagree i think the time is done now with letting people speak to you like that actually it's been over for a while for me and it's like if, if i have you know i have to bear in mind that whenever i strongly express my opinion because i am uh, that's how i am it's like I, I, if i see injustice i'll call it out if i disagree with you i will tell you i will speak my truth and i will you know i say what i mean and i mean what i say and for some people that's uncomfortable that isn't my problem, actually. That's your problem. And if you call me sassy, if you bring down any tropes or stereotypes on me around that, I will challenge you on it. I will say, why are you calling me that? Is it because I'm black? And they better have a fucking answer. <laughs> the end. I'm done letting people, I'm done cuddling, coddling, I'm done with the white fragility, I'm done with all of the microaggressions and the macro. No, we're, uh, it's over. I disagree. Stand up for yourself. Put your foot down and tell people when they're racist. That's yeah. fucking racist. And, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, certainly now. I think. Sorry, I, th I think I've. Um, uh, but in terms of saying, you know, that you're done with, you're done with uh, sort of letting people get away with things. I'd like to think that now is the time that we can start addressing things. Um, I mean, it should have always been that way. Um, but in terms of. Um, just to see if we've a few more right, a few more uh, questions but just in terms of of moving forward um obviously the restaurant industry is now emerging it's starting to emerge from the sort of the covid shutdown um i mean do you think do you think the recovery is going to be more challenging um especially with considering everything we've spoken about for black people in food and for black businesses i mean do you think it's going to be even more difficult um without the resources that we're yeah. talking about um, to, to recover from this. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the, yeah. the answer is yes, because we don't have the same access to finance. We don't have the so, same so, access. So where, where do we go from now? Um, so there's the, oh. Carry on. Hello? Sorry, no, no, I can I, hear I, you. I, I, you cut off. Okay, okay. good. Um, so, so where do we, where do we go from now? So, so the, um, a group of black authors have formed the Black Writers Guild um, and they are pointing sweeping change across the, public, the publishing industry to address deep-rooted racial inequalities. Um, does hospitality need something like that? There's, there's um, a vein in hospitality which has started off. I mean, do we need a specifically black organisation to, to challenge the racism in, in this industry? Where do we go from now? Sorry. Yes, I have the solution. <laughs> can, can, I, can we buy it from you? Well, you can pay me for it for sure. No, <laughs> I, I have a solution. So basically, look, for a long time, for month, well, for a couple of years actually, and my experience in the States has shown me this, is that black community needs black community to support it in the food industry. That is just the bottom line because whatever work has to be done in what an all white space is deep, very deep work. And it's systemic and it's like untraining your brain for like hundreds of generations of thinking. So that work that is necessary, it will be slow, even if most people take up the mantle of doing it. And so, you know, I've been advocating for years now for black people, like for black people in food and beverage 
to come together to create our own platforms, to create our own mm. spaces and to create our own networks. And in light of that, so I and myself and Frankie, who you mentioned earlier, and Anna Sully Matsu, we are creating um, a platform which is a thought leadership platform in one respect and consultancy, but also it's an agency representing black and people of color talent uh, globally, not just in the UK. So the idea is to actually combine PR, marketing and representation in the traditional agency model, but combine it with kind of the mentorship you, we might be able to get from the Reigns uh, Bayman Hospitality. She's building an amazing platform. So we'll be linking up with her for sure. And it's about that. It's like working with other organizations to put all the pieces in place so where we can showcase black excellence and reward black excellence appropriately. And also to guide these people in whichever path they want to follow to, to be able to pursue their dreams. So it's like business coaching, um, self-growth coaching, mentorship, self-care, uh, you know, all of the aspects that any black person needs to have under their belt to keep with the existing state of white privilege, which means that any white person can walk into any space that is white and feeling very comfortable. There's plenty of white spaces for them. And, you know, they just don't have the same challenges. Even if you took a black kid out of a school now from a deprived area. And also, this isn't just about deprived black people. Cause not all fucking deprived, by the way. <laughs> it's just about, it's about giving people the tools to, that they will need. They will need to be able to contact newspapers. They will need to be able to understand how to build a social platform. They'll need to understand uh, what are the steps towards getting a restaurant, if that's what they want. But also, what are all the other available careers? Because they could be food stylists, editors, you know, whatever their dream is, we want to help them reach that goal, basically. So that's what we're creating, Black Book. And it's launching, an, uh, we're launching a series of talks at the end of June, actually, about decolonizing the food industry. And so you'll, you'll get some insights in those talks into what we're about and what we, what we intend to do. And we hope to be partnering with as many uh, organizations as possible particularly black so if you are a black business or a black chef or a black writer or a black anything and you want to be represented by people that look like you then get in touch so sorry, so that, that sounds amazing and that's really exciting and brilliant um you are in a position to be able to equip people with those school those skills of because for instance approaching media and things like that um but how we get the media how do we break that that, that kind of white ceiling um to get the publications to actually give people the column inches and well look here's the, the truth airtime. the reality as well is we have to stop also seeking the approval of these institutions and white spaces because at the end of the day you know are they our, you know are, they're not necessarily our customer base this is the thing like we get trained to think we need those column inches. We get trained to think we need to be in those publications. I don't need to be in the Telegraph. I don't need to be in the Times. Like, why? Why do I need that? That's not where my customers are. You know, so we have to kind of train to, uh, to de decolonize the thinking that we need to even be in those spaces. And, you know, don't waste energy fighting to be into a space where you're not invited or welcome. When mm. we can create, we can use our existing platforms um, better you know and we can create our existing platforms we don't it, it doesn't necessarily benefit everybody necessarily to be in those spaces it depends what you're doing it depends you know for some people yes it will be necessary if they're doing a cookbook or they're doing x y or z there are certain places you need to reach but it's not necessarily there for everyone so i'm a huge advocate for everybody taking this opportunity taking the opportunity for what will soon be i imagine very cheap rent in the uk and property prices and taking the advantage of um, slightly easier access to finance than we have previously experienced in the past as a as a community and as a race and build your own businesses you know build your own food pr company but don't do it in a silo to stop. Everyone needs to stop thinking. The, the reason these people are successful is because they are networked, right? That's all we need to be is networked. And we, we can- So you're always saying ignore the, ignore the traditional media, ignore, um, ignore all that. And then, and, and it's almost, well, not, not necessarily I'm starting from- I'm not saying from ignore from scratch, it. I'm, they saying, are... I'm saying don't focus on it. Like the, there's no need to be focused on it necessarily. There are platforms 
out there. There's Whetstone magazine, there's For the Culture magazine. There's a global audience, right, that, of black people. They're not, you know, they're not all just in pockets of London or in pockets of Manchester. They're all over the world. We have a continent full of black people with amazing media networks, TV networks and print and online publications. You know, everybody just needs to think a little bit bigger and get out of the, the colonized mind. That's all that needs to happen. And I'm here to help them do it. That's the end. Mm. Exciting. Um, so I've had another question, just uh, we're almost done, um, but it's just, um, so, so two questions uh, sort of related. What is the best way to approach the topic of biodiversity and quality with management within a workplace? Any tips would be greatly appreciated. So I'm not sure whether that's coming from um, the, uh, sort of a white person asking us, um, but then also how can we as consumers and employees unite to pressure and expose restaurants that have conscious and unconscious racist biases economically and by threatening their industry standing. I mean, I'm like, just don't go, don't go there. What, what, uh, what, what we I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't even know what part of the, that, that seemed like it was 10 questions. <laughs> you know what? It was two, it was two. Yeah, yeah. With lots of clauses. Every, everyone who wants to know how to sort out their diversity issues, get this book, read it, do the work, okay? Go through it like an actual workbook, give it to all of your employees and make them all do it as well, no matter what color they are. That, the only way you change systemically is by changing the way people think. So you need to open and expand minds. You need to get people to see what's going on. You need people to do the difficult work at looking at themselves and where they're letting themselves down and therefore letting their black friends, colleagues and black society down generally. So I suggest everybody go out Read that book, and that would be a great starting point. Me and White Supremacy by the amazing Layla F. Saad. And after that, to be honest, stop asking me, stop asking black people what to do. There's an oh, internet. Yeah. Look it up, Google, use, like, do some work. Do you know how much work we have to do every day? Like, just to exist, to manage like other people's fragility, to manage other people's racism in a way that neither of us get offended right mm. that is work it takes up a lot of energy and it's very stressful and it's very tiring so i think the time has come for white people to get on with doing their own work to be honest mm -hmm. i have to admit though since i've come to hong kong i've not had to face any of that and i think i don't know whether it's because like they're used to having so such diversity or they just don't care but i've not had any of that um when when working so it's been really like a breath of fresh air it's been really nice Lovely. uh yeah yeah like oh, they're, they're happy with the answers though like where are you from england and i oh that's nice i went to school here and you're like oh cool you know that's it end of discussion you know um so yeah <laughs> it's good, it's good. Uh, yeah i do kind of feel like um so oh sorry can you guys hear me yeah yeah yeah, no, I was just saying, like, I do things subconsciously and I have set my business up because I just got sick of, like, so our, ha you know, I, I just didn't want to, I got oh, to the oh. point where, I, oh, I just Kim, got sorry. to the point, yeah? I can't, I can't hear you, Kim. Oh. I can. I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I think yeah okay yeah no i was just saying um i think subconsciously that's why i may have started my business it's like okay i had a passion for food i had a passion for coffee but i just got to the point where i was sick of like the bullshit and i just mm. i just got to that point where i was like you know what i don't want to answer to anybody anymore i want to create my own rules i want to create my own environment I want to create my own narrative and tell my own story and, you know, have um, control a lot, you know, not complete control, but have a good amount of control of who walks in through the door, you know, what the customers, the clientele who we're serving, it's like, this is our sort of community. And so I don't have those day-to-day -day struggles where, you know, I'm getting questioned and, you know, where are you from? Or, you know, um, I don't know. Can I can I touch your hair? Where's your oh dad from? Oh my god! You know? Oh the um, hair! Like you hair. know.
um, all of that stuff. Oh. It's just I don't get that. Um, and I'm, I'm almost at the point as well where I'm like, okay, maybe we need to renew and relook at our contracts, uh, our employee contracts, because it always says equal opportunities, but it's like, what does that actually mean? You know, it's, you know, I, I've been reading um, Me and White Supremacy. I don't necessarily need to read it, but I also need, I, I want that understanding. I want to dig deep to be able to like protect myself and be like, okay, you're stepping out of line and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to call you out. You know, I'm going to um, oppose what you're saying. Like, I'm not going to just be cool with it because I've set up my own business to get away from that bullshit. And right. <laughs> um, so, yeah. See, I've never had that that issue of, of calling people out, but I think it's because, like, so so my my family aesthetic, like, half of them are, are you know, like, uh, French Lebanese uh, slash Gambian, and then the other half are, are English, British. And I've always been, and, and they're all, like, uh, it's, it's quite a, like, matriarch-heavy uh, family as well. So I've always been taught, you know, like, about, like, feminists and, like, stand for yourself always you know say what you think with a limit obviously but like if anyone's doing anything untoward towards me then I'll automatically like I've never shied away not from confrontation but if someone's done something that displeases me or they've tried to um sort of like put me down because of my race I've you know I've always been like who are you like what's your issue if you have an issue with me you know there's a there's a big space over there you can go to you know and I've never really had an issue confronting people like I, I used to have it when I was uh, a lot younger you know at school um, at one point I was like the only the only black kid in like a school of 400 people so it, you know you kind of notice but then I just I it, you 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 just get on with it and like I used to just ignore the fact and like if they ever tried to be racist you know I'd, I'd nip it in the bud that my parents would um so so things like that I, I've never had an issue calling out people Lord, um, I, I can't hear um, my. Sorry. <laughs> it's gone five o'clock, and so um, we have to unfortunately say goodbye. Um, I wish I could have he heard what you were both saying, but um, thank you to everyone who's joined us, um, to Lord, to Kim, and to Zoe. Um, yeah, you've given me um, a lot of food for thought. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you. you. And thank you for everyone thank joining you. as well. Thank you. Thank you to everybody that turned up. <laughs> thank you. Oh, they're <laughs> telling me it's time to go. <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye. Oh. I, can't, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Uh, oh. I'm going to go home now. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.